everyone, I'm Ratna Omidvar, I'm the Executive Director of the Global Diversity Exchange. Today is May the 7th. It's a very big day for us because we're having our formal launch here in Toronto. But since we're a global institute, we're bringing you leading thoughts and leading ideas over the web in this way. Uh, and I'm talking today to Pico Aya. Pico is our inaugural guest lecturer for tonight. Uh, Pico is an acclaimed author, the author of many books, uh, including his latest, The Art of Stillness, uh, and others, The Global Soul, Video Nights in Kathmandu. He also writes for many magazines. He writes on many subjects. I just read today, di as diverse as Graham Greene to <laughs> Leonard Cohen. Uh, and he's been named uh, by uh, Utne Reader, which some of you will know of as one of the most influ influential travel writers and thinkers of today. So welcome, Pico. Thank you. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. It's wonderful to have you here because you are, as you write about, but I think you are a global soul because you are uh, a, a citizen of many parts of the world and a resident possibly of none. Or should <laughs> I flip that? Comment on that. <coughs> yes, I suppose the whole world is my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, but what really strikes me <coughs> is that when I was a, a little kid, and you know the same because you're a global citizen. It seemed like such an unusual thing when we were 18 years old to have pieces of many different cultures inside us. And now if you look around us in the streets of Toronto, it's the norm. We are the majority, we being the people with many, many different homes. So I love the fact that whether we like it or not, the global citizenship has taken over so much of the world in my lifetime. And what used to be a peculiarity and would mark you as something different, now in Singapore or Hong Kong or London, New York, New York or especially Canadian cities, marks you as a typical Canadian, that you belong to everywhere else. Um, so you're right, I've never claimed a nation, and I think if I were to define myself as a nation, I would start to think about us versus them and start to think about enemy nations. But defining myself perhaps in another way might begin to free me from certain of those more divisive That's definitions. so interesting. Um, so if you don't define yourself as a nation, and, and you, you know, I should tell the audience, you were born in Oxford, uh, you studied in, uh, in the UK, then you went and lived in California, and now you live in rural Japan. Yes, and both my parents are from India. So both yes. of your parents are. So you're truly, you know, of this and that. Mm. But if you don't define yourself by nation, do you define yourself by community? Maybe by enthusiasm and by passion. And you mentioned just now Graham Greene and Leonard Cohen. Yeah. If I define myself as somebody who's been formed a lot by them or feel a kinship yeah. with them, I think that takes me out of some of the resentments or vicious cycles of my grandparents' day, for example. And I often think that when my grandparents were born, they almost had a tribe and a caste and a religion and a sense of us and a sense of them given to them at birth. Mm -hmm. Whereas the likes of you and me and more and more young people in some ways liberated from that and that their sense of belonging or community is more something chosen as a partner is than inherited as a parent is. And so I've always thought that I was lucky maybe to be able to define myself in ways that are not separating people but uh, including them. How interesting. If, what if the world uh, embraced new identities as opposed to holding on uh, to, to old ones? Uh, I read somewhere that memory is our greatest problem in history. Yes, because yes. we hold on to resentments, yes. we hold on to memories, yes. and 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 that fuels uh, uh, alienation and war, as we well know, in many parts. So maybe um, having being chameleon-like in this way, as as I am, is is possibly uh, the way to go. But. There are, there are clear, uh, you know, there are those who would say, but I, I define myself in this way. I was in uh, Sweden, for instance, lately, or was it Finland, sorry. I kind of get that mixed up a little, where people said to me, we have so many new people who come and live in our country. How can we teach them to embrace, what is that sport called? Uh, l l Langlauf uh, Shifan, uh, skiing, long distance skiing, mm. which is the way they define themselves. Mm. Being Finnish yes. means loving how to ski. Yes. And I said to them, I don't think you're going to get <laughs> the Sri Lankan who's coming to Sweden or Finland uh, to work on the, oil, on the oil rigs to love skiing. Mm. 
And maybe the happier result would be if the Sri Lankan got the Finn or Swedes to love Sri Lankan curry and yes. the Sri Lankan you know, spices and the many other things Sri Lanka has to offer, so that Sweden has a larger identity than it did hitherto. And I loved what you said about memory, because my sense is that so often people are tempted to define themselves by where they came from, and one could define oneself by where one's going in some ways. And that is a more positive, in every sense, definition, because you're, as you said, not defining yourself by old enmities or hostilities or wars, uh, but by shared passions or direction in some way. Um, I was just reading this, this wonderful new novel by Kazuo Ishiguro about an mm. elderly couple who, uh, whose memory is a complete mist. And at some level, it's about Alzheimer's and about whether it's good for them to get their memory or whether, in fact, they're liberated by the fact that they can't even remember the bad things that they've done to one another. But implicit throughout the book is just what you were saying about national memory. Mm -hmm. and, in, and that's what is a burden on whether it's Germany or in England or India. Um, they remember the grievances or grudges of 600 years ago and can't put them behind them. And a kind of <laughs> political Alzheimer's may, in some ways, liberate them or, from or, or certain of those curses. In, this, in, in many contexts, the need to redress past wrongs, which is yes. uh, you know, also part of, of, at least here in Canada, the mm. Canadian conversation. What I'm fascinated by, Pico, is that you are, you've chosen to be, mm. uh, be sort of on the outside always. Yes and, yes. and part of this is legal because you are, you've lived in Japan for 27 years, <laughs> yes. but on a tourist visa. Yes. How does that happen? How does that happen? Can you just explain to us and our audiences who are always so keen on regulating status and, you know, having the rights of citizenship? Mm. And here you are as a tourist in Japan with a wife and a home, 27 years, how does that work? Well, in the Japanese instance, it's a way of reminding myself, I can't presume to a Japanese-ness I haven't earned. I can't claim to be Japanese, nor can I hope to be. Because if I were there 60 years and spoke fluent Japanese, the Japanese would very be very keen to keep me on the outside, and it's true that I wouldn't be a Japanese person. So indeed, as you say, I could have a spousal visa, I could have all kinds of other visas, but it's a way of reminding myself the one reason I'm in Japan is to look at it with the wide and admiring eyes of a tourist, not to take things for granted, um, and also not to pretend to be something I couldn't be. But in a deeper sense, I think you put your finger on the fact that I've been a foreigner since birth, really, and that's my sense of home. So as a little boy in England, I sounded and played and thought probably like all the other little boys around me, but at some level I knew that I didn't look like them and that my ancestry was different from theirs, and that I was a foreigner, and I thought that foreign, foreigners opened certain doors to me and windows and offered me certain perceptions I wouldn't have perhaps if I were a resident. And so probably at a fairly early stage in my life, I thought that there are certain great deficiencies in being a foreigner, as you suggest, which is, what's your sense of political accountability? What's your sense of obligation to a community? I've never in my 58 years owned a piece of property. My wife and I share a two-room rented apartment as if we were 21 years old still. <laughs> We've been there for more than 20 years. So those are all shadow sides of being a foreigner. But the good side is um, feeling wide awake, adaptable, uh, and not taking things as a given. And as a little boy, I thought, well, even though I've grown up as a child of uh, English birth and Indian ancestry with an American residence, I am a foreigner in England and, uh, and in the United States and in India. And although that excludes me from certain things, it means that when I go to Paraguay or Yemen or North Korea, I'm not disconcerted because I'm a foreigner there too. And I'm, that's the, the position I'm comfortable with. And that's probably the reason why I've chosen the most foreign society on earth, Japan, yes. to be my, my full-time residence. Clearly, I'm a freak of nature and not, <laughs> not an example anyone should follow because you know, there are problems, as I say, to being a perpetual foreigner. But it happens to be what suits me. Um, and, I, and I think it's partly just a temperamental thing, whether you see the glass as half full or half empty. And so growing up, I thought either I can feel bereft or aggrieved at not having a full sense of citizenship, or I can look at the, w the opportunities that opens up to me that I wouldn't have had if I were one of my grandparents who had a very fixed sense of where they belonged and who their people were. So I've chosen to try to look at the opportunities. I want to uh, move to, uh, I've, to a subject that I've heard you speak about, 
uh, and I think it relates to everyone on an individual level, and that is, you know, play. <laughs> and, and how uh, you have observed, in, in your own life, how uh, the unusual uh, sport of ping pong, <laughs> even the word is, is kind of strange, <laughs> Funny, rolling yes. off my tongue, <laughs> ping pong, has, brought, has made you more Japanese or made you able to understand Japanese. But how, how, how did that all happen? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, as, as I, we were just saying, I've lived in Japan all these years, I, and I was horrifying you by admitting I almost never eat Japanese food. I speak almost no Japanese. Uh, I, of course, never wear Japanese clothes. And Japan, more than almost anywhere, again, we were just saying, uh, has a very sharp definition of public and private. And of course, the Japanese couldn't be more formal and impeccable in going through the social world. But for probably my fif first 15 years in the country, I'd never talked to a Japanese man. Japanese women are very keen to make contact with the rest of the world, partly perhaps because they have so few opportunities within Japan. They have every incentive to come to Canada or the United States to marry a foreigner, as my wife did, to, to become part of the larger world. But Japanese men are entrenched in the system and I think uh, unsettled by foreigners. So I never, I had a very two-dimensional vision of Japanese men. And then my wife introduced me to a ping pong club in the health club across the street from our little apartment. And I went in there and within a few hours I was seeing a completely different unbuttoned, spontaneous, warm, inviting, unrehearsed side of Japan. It was wonderful. And I was just talking last night to a friend and saying, if ever somebody comes to Japan, the first thing I recommend they do is go to the baseball stadium. And every stereotype they have about Japan will be upended within 20 minutes because the Japanese are more rabid and passionate than anyone you would see watching the Blue Jays or even the Red Sox or the Yankees. They're gregarious. Grandmothers will come and, uh, and throw their arms around a stranger like me. They're so happy that we are joined in the community of being Hanshin Tigers fans rather than the more excluding community of Japan. Uh, and they're, they're boisterous and gregarious and fun-loving as soon as they're divested of their obligations in the social world. And I think in Japan everything's very ceremonial uh, and theatrical and so they feel they have to act a certain way when they're on the bus or in the post office. But in the baseball stadium, as in the bar, they're liberated to be very different. And so ping pong was my way suddenly both to get a better sense of how Japan operates. For, exa for example, nobody ever is allowed to lose a game of ping pong. The score is barely announced, so nobody is thinking about winning or losing. The main thing is just harmony. And so in the middle of a game, suddenly you'll notice your partner has changed because they've noticed you know, I'm not doing very well, and so a very good player will suddenly become my partner. So they have an to, equalization exactly, strategy. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> and all their, all their strategies are evident at the ping pong table, but at the same time, they're relieved of certain of the social pressures and are much more themselves, and are jumping around and high-fiving and pumping their fists and extremely welcoming to me. And I'm the only foreigner in this group of 30 or so. So it's, it's been a way to, to see how Jap Japan functions socially, not least the fact that um, the men are the ones who announce the score and make all the official decisions, but you can tell the women are running everything in the ping pong club and essentially in Japan itself. So I'm so grateful to that little, as you said, curious, unexpected, <laughs> mad passion for opening a door to a Japan I never would have seen because by virtue of being on the tourist visa, I've never worked a day of my life in Japan. I've never studied there. I've had no contact really with Japanese society. I'm not usually at my desk writing. But the ping pong club has allowed me to step into Japan in a very welcoming context and for the Japanese to embrace me almost literally. So I feel like those are some of my closest friends in the world, even though we don't exchange much in the way of words, and I don't know much about their lives, but I feel I know who they are, and they know who I am very well indeed. So, you know, we, we concern ourselves here at the Global Diversity Exchange uh, uh, with, with how diversity uh, that is a result of migration uh, can actually uh, make the world a better place, both for the people who come and the people who are here for receiving, sending societies. And I have noticed that uh, the role of sport is largely understated and muted. Mm. And I'm not quite sure why, because it's, uh, it's you know, children will play regardless of where they are. Yes. Parents will watch their children from the sidelines, regardless of whether they're in Germany or Canada or Afghanistan. Yes. It's, it's human. Yes. So, you know, this human impulse um, 
uh, at play probably manifests itself best in formal or informal forms of play. In, in all your travels, have you been able to comment on uh, or, or have you been able to see where play or sport uh, leads to more understanding outside in Japan or, or conversely where it leads to as we w we I'm sure we can imagine fierce competition and separation yes what a wonderful question no one's ever asked me that before I actually covered six Olympic Games for Time magazine ah, and so that was a perfect way for mm -hmm. seeing the family of man in all its divisive familiness in other words and what I loved about the Olympic Games was that in the opening ceremonies everybody is segregated wearing their own colors carrying their own flag and then in the closing ceremonies all the colors run all the divisions dissolve everybody merges together in the central green space in the stadium and so that's a vision of what the best case scenario for our age of movement and our shifting world. But at the same time, of course, the, the Olympic Games, which is about the family and harmony of man, is predicated on national divisions. Um, very fierce. And I remember yeah. every time I would go there, the North Koreans would have a fit because they didn't want to be on the same pitch as the South Koreans. And the Iranians would refuse Hi. to march in the opening ceremonies because there was a woman holding the flag and they didn't want them. And all the problems of the world assemble in one place. And so in some ways, the Olympic Games is like Toronto or Los Angeles or London, which is a wonderful infusion of all the colors and cultures of the world, but a reminder that they're bringing some of their problems, their assumptions, their divisive prejudices along with them, as well as their foods and their spirit. But um, I love what you said about sports, because I remember growing up in England uh, at a time when we never saw dark-skinned people. And to this day, I think it'll be a long time before we see a brown-skinned Prime Minister of England or, or Archbishop of Canterbury, say. And yet, if you look at the English soccer team or cricket team, they want as many dark-skinned people as possible. And they're very happy to claim Indians and West Indians as Englishmen as soon as they're representing England on the sporting field, but in other contexts, not. And not. there is that funny division that, as you say, uh, play dissolves so many of the the us versus them and things, yet it, and yet it, they're still there behind the scenes, and the so US is the same thing, probably. I, I have a wonderful story to tell you, which sort of speaks to the way I became a Canadian, uh, because I do claim nationality very proudly. Mm. Um, when I came to Canada, my daughter, uh, she was six or seven years old, uh, we put her into a gymnastics club because we thought that's what you do, you, you, you get into a club, I mean, it was probably more foresighted uh, than I give myself credit for because now I tell everybody join a club um, and during the weekends we would take the children uh, to leagues to competitions and it was always the parents driving them and making coffee uh, and making sandwiches and my best settlement instrument or integration instrument became that gym club Lovely. because it was those mothers who taught me about you know hanging out together and speaking a common language and making those really awful North American <laughs> peanut butter and jelly <laughs> sandwiches you remember have you ever yes. had those yeah. so that, that that was an absolutely uh, uh, defining moment in my life um, and I tell people become joiners mm. you know don't stay on the outside yeah you though have chosen to be because, and I, I think I recognize that when, when you stay on the outside, y you're able to be more observant. Mm -hmm. You're able to be more critical and, and more reflective. When you're in, in the inside, you, are, you, have a, you have a loyalty. And when you're on the inside, something else happens. Yes. And I'm trying to see it from, from both the insider and outsider point of view. So I love that story because that is your ping pong, isn't it? That, that, was, that was your ping pong. And, was and, and it also reminds me that to some extent I am inside Japan when I'm in that ping pong framework and, yes. uh, and, and I want to be. And of course, they often say in England especially, you know which is your real home by whom you're supporting in the Olympics. Or when England plays India in cricket, who are you behind? So I must say that although I know I'll never be a Japanese, I think of myself as a bit of an honorary Canadian and a spiritual oh. Canadian. And for many years, I said that this is the one country I would love to consider myself a part of, in large part because so many Canadians are like you and essentially share m exactly my conditions. Coming to Canada with many different places inside and wanting to be part of this new global conversation, to me, Canada is the perfect example of that. So I often will be supporting Canada in the oh, Olympic Games. Isn't, yes. isn't that wonderful? Um, That's wonderful.
Let's talk a little bit about freedom, the freedom to travel, mm. the freedom mm. to be who mm. you are, mm. the freedom to be, to choose to be a foreign tourist, yes. to yes. be a tourist, yes. and come to California, yes. and come to Canada. Yeah. And what's happening today in the world, which is the, the limitations mm. on, on free movement. Mm. I, I believe, and I, I think uh, most people will agree, the urge to move, to adventure, to experience something new is, is, is a primal urge, mm -hmm. and as old as, 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 and yet we have now situations where people are prevented from moving, people are, are pushed off boats, mm -hmm. they're not allowed to mm -hmm. enter. Uh, as, a, as an observer, because you're not a politician and I'm not going to ask you a policy <laughs> question, <laughs> as an observer, what do you make of this human tragedy? You're so, so right. And when you were talking before about how migration has added so much to the world, I was thinking instantly of world music, fusion cuisine, the excitements and literature of cultures overlapping. And that's, to me, the great plus. The great shadow side, which I think this, your question is pointing out, is that there are few of us of the privileged class who are the visible cooks or writers or musicians. But the vast majority of people on the move were propelled out of their homes by necessity, famine, war, mm. uh, totalitarianism, and never wanted to leave their homes, and are not in the position as I am, or you are perhaps, of being able to choose an identity, but suddenly are catapulted into a, a, a vacuum, when they're stuck between the country that's rejecting them and another country that's not taking them in. And I think that, as you suggest, is the great story of right now. And there's a curious disconnect whereby the people who are speaking about migration and globalism, such as myself, um, are unrepresentative and actually often yes. don't begin to understand what the typical person from Somalia or Syria or a million other places are going through. And they, by definition, are voiceless and too easily forgotten. I think the great majority of people living in countries not their own are hungering to be back in their countries yes. and don't see it as a choice. They see it as a horrible necessity yes. that circumstances have pushed them into. Yes. Uh, and that really places a pressure on the receiving countries to except that the necessity of the modern world is they have to make a home for people who've lost their homes from Syria, for example, to, to use a, a current um, predicament. Uh, and it's terrifying how little we know about them. 32,000 people are being displaced from their home every day. And the average refugee spends 17 years in exile. And by the fact of being ex in exile is overlooked and forgotten and unheard. And so we will hear Salman Rushdie or Michael Andache or the likes of you and me uh, who are exulting in these new possibilities, and we won't hear from the six million people yes. who are stuck in the refugee camps. Uh, and, well, as you know, I mean, you know ten times more about this than I do, but up to 20,000 people losing their lives just in the Mediterranean in the last 20 years. And when we think of the Mediterranean, we think of holidays and the, the, yeah. the, the destinies we're choosing. And there are these people who don't even make it to the country of arrival, but the passage itself is, is fatal for them. Uh, and it's a greater and greater problem. And I think one thing that I've been writing about since I was small is um, the way in which TV and media make all the world seem very close. Mm -hmm. In other words, somebody growing up in uh, East Africa or Bangladesh today can see the promise of New York City or Toronto or Los Angeles, and it yes. looks as close as that. And yet in his or her attempt to reach that, she will end up drowned under the yes. sea or at the mercy of you know, predatory people. Smuggled, smuggled. Yes. Um, and I think that's one of the great little told stories of the world. And one of the beauties of traveling is that you quickly run into that because half the people you meet want to leave their countries and you suddenly notice how many families are implicated in the terrible stories of migration. So I'm glad that at least in Canada compared with the United States there's more of a global awareness and consciousness of those people but it's, there's still never enough. There's never enough. And that's what Global diversity exchange, I think, is partly mm -hmm. trying to rectify. Uh, you're a travel writer. Mm. So that's how some people mm. describe you. I, has anyone asked you to do a travel story about this end of the travel? Uh, I've asked myself. Okay, <laughs> so uh, a few years ago, I thought I'm living in California and Japan both places that are almost unreal because they're so privileged and so cocooned from the rest of the world. I feel I'm almost living in a gated community. And I'm talking about frequent flyer miles where 98% of my global neighbors will never even dream of being on a plane. Mm -hmm. Or I'm talking about the internet at a time when two-thirds of the people on the planet never used a telephone. 
So I'm living in this, this total bubble, I felt. And so I spent several years, four years, really going to the poorest places in many corners of the world, Bolivia, Haiti, Yemen, Ethiopia, Cambodia, Easter Island, many more, just to remind myself, this is how almost all my global, global neighbors are living. And if I start pontificating on the world, those are the presences I have to remember, not the handful of us who are lucky enough to be sitting yes. in a comfortable room in Toronto. And um, I think that, again, that's exactly what you are caretaking in this exchange. But um, so, uh, so every now and then, uh, magazines have asked me to do things akin to that, but I think they ask more qualified people usually, and as they should, um, mm. who have really studied it. Uh, but and every now and then I will try to smuggle that in. A travel magazine will send me off to Ethiopia and I'll write about the beauty of the culture and then I'll say, by the way, <laughs> this is what's really going on, which is you know, people which neglected is, yeah. by the world and people in desperate trouble. Yes. yes, yes. And I think people wanting to leave has probably been the one theme of my writing since the beginning. So you mentioned my first book, Video Night in Kathmandu. And that was partly about those of us from the privileged West going to the East in search of antiquity and, and wisdom and community and a sense of tradition. But the people we would meet in the East all longed to come to the West as a place of opportunity and modernity and material plenty, as understandably they would. And faces pressed against the windows of these possibilities they never knew that they could yeah. touch. And I think I love the way that travel humanizes and humbles you in that way and reminds you of how much many of us take for granted and how many people don't have the simplest things in the world. Yeah. So I want to yeah. get back to being formed. Yes. Because that... that is is such an interesting word to use for your identity. Is that just for you? Is that highly individualized to Pico Aya and what Pico Aya does? Or is it, do you think, a state of being that, that you would say is normal today? Not normal, probably. Okay. But I do think every migrant has a choice to some extent about, and, we, and it's one that we never resolve perfectly, how much we want to assimilate, how much we want to remain outside. But we do have that choice, whatever, whether we're a privileged migrant or a less privileged one. Uh, and I think the writer by his nature is an outsider. In mm -hmm. other words, even if I were writing about my family, about my parents, to, to make them live on the page, I would have to stand outside them in some ways. And so, for example, just four days ago, I was doing an on-stage discussion with Michael Ondaatje, and I was probing him because his work is mostly about disconnection and always being a foreigner, even in Sri Lanka or even mm. in Canada, and that's really the beauty of it. But I think he and I and a handful of others are very much the exception. Uh, and if we choose to be a foreigner, we have to address some pretty serious questions about <laughs> where are we laying down roots, where are we politically engaged in, where are we responsible to? Uh, because I, I don't think you can just float above the world in, yeah, a, in yeah. a kind of fairy tale. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting idea to always have a little bit of the outsider in you because it helps you stay uncomfortable. That's nice, And, yes. and staying uncomfortable makes you a little edgier. I'm going yes. to use hip cool language. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and being inside maybe sometimes makes you too comfortable. Uh, but maybe you need a bit of both. And the migrant mm. is always going to be a bit on the outside, mm. a bit on the inside. And, and that's, I think, a conclusion I have to make. I don't want to romanticize uh, you know, being foreign, yeah. because it's it's always it's great for you. Yes, and it's great for yes. Michael and Dutch yes, and others. Yes, yes. I understand that completely. Yes, but for uh, yeah. you know ordinary, right. not that you're not ordinary, because we are all ordinary in a way. But for for other people, I would say, um, take the best of all worlds yes. and make it your own. Yes, and what I would say is one of the beauties of the modern global age is the outsider is making even the insider have to rethink her identity. So somebody yes. who's lived in Canada for six generations yes. is surrounded by people who look like the two of us. We are typical Canadians yes. now, and is going to have to rethink what being inside is and what being Canadian is. And that's, as you say, a wonderful thing. I loved what you said. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is Emerson saying, everywhere people want to be settled and only in so far as they are unsettled is there hope for them. So I like what you say about That's, the discomfort and, yeah. uh, and that we as migrants are importing a useful discomfort to the people who are too settled in their assumptions. Thank you, Pika. That was absolutely wonderful. We look forward to your lecture tonight and I know that our audience in the Global Diversity Exchange will have lots of questions and maybe you will at some point 
answer them. Maybe. It's been a real delight. Thank, Thank you so you much. Very much.